First founded in 1762, Charlottesville, Virginia is perhaps most well known as the hometown of U.S. President Thomas Jefferson. It's also where his public university, the University of Virginia, is located. This is where I spoke with Dr. Petrie, a physician scientist at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. What we're studying is how the immune response is different in different patients with COVID-19. And what we've discovered is that there's an allergic type immune response that if you have that, you're much more likely to have severe respiratory failure. And um, we're actually intervening in a mouse model of COVID-19 and have shown that if we inhibit that immune response, we're able to protect a mouse from experimental COVID-19. So what does that tell me if, if I'm suddenly finding out that my test is positive? Uh, what type of person needs to be more concerned versus someone else, would you say? Yeah, so I think the first thing is if your test is positive, you, you should know that, that in four out of five times, you're going to do just fine as an outpatient and not require hospitalization. Probably the way that you know that, that you might need more medical care is if you become short of breath. That's usually the symptom that brings people into the hospital because we can fix that by giving supplemental oxygen. And what we're studying right now is um, how can we predict once you're in the hospital, how severe the respiratory disease will become. And what we've discovered is that this one allergic cytokine, interleukin-13, if that's high on the day that you're admitted, it makes you about three times more likely to need mechanical ventilation, to so have like the most severe form of respiratory failure. So you can just get it down to the, uh, the cytokine, as you said, and, and pinpoint that. So what does that tell you? Um, I mean, and how do you go down that path? Because I guess there's so many different avenues you can take when you're studying this sort of thing and trying to come up with a solution. Yeah, so we took a really open-ended approach to it. With technology today, we can measure in a single sample from a patient 48 different cytokines or immune signaling molecules. And so we did that in about 200 patients with COVID-19. Then just asked like, what uh, immune signaling molecules predict a worse outcome. And that's how we stumbled across IL-13. Um, talk to me, let's, let's take a, a step back. Um, I was looking at, at some of the information about COVID-19 and you can be, it's almost quicksand, you can swim through so much mm -hmm. of it now. Yeah. But I was going back to January of 2020. And at the time, I believe there were only 40 cases, 41 cases in Wuhan and one death. And that's when the scientists or researchers from China released the genetic sequence. And then the race was on, right? I mean, how important was that? And then what happens once that's out there for the world to start attacking and going after things? Barney Graham at the NIH used that sequence to identify the spike glycoprotein to messenger RNA. And that's what the messenger RNA is in the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So, so it, was, it was key to have that information released early in January. So at that time, was your interest already peaked or when do you guys come on board and start looking at things? Yes, I, w I was very interested and concerned in January because this was so similar to previous coronavirus spillover events, you know, from animals into people. And so the MERS of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and SARS, the original severe acute respiratory syndrome that we saw 20 years ago. And so I, I, I was concerned, though I, I was actually optimistic in January that China by isolation, limiting travel, would be able to, to restrict it um, just as they had with the original SARS. And so it was very unexpected to me to, to see the worldwide transmission. Dr. Petrie is a professor of infectious diseases and international health at the University of Virginia. He's also the vice chair for research in the school's Department of Medicine. COVID-19, when it first emerged, I mean, I think about what it must have been like to be a doctor, you know, and somebody presents themselves and you don't really know what it is. Um, how difficult is that process to actually try and identify, oh, it's this new thing, and then what do we know then and what do we know today? Because I think we learn more and more about this each passing day, don't we? Clearly. 
And I think it is remarkable how fast the Chinese medical authorities identified that they were dealing with a new infectious disease, because that, that's incredibly difficult. They, they saw a number of patients that were in like one geographic location that had a viral pneumonia. You know, in most cases, like we don't identify what the cause of a pneumonia is. And so to, to realize that this could be a, a different pneumonia that had been seen before is just, is remarkable and was very, very important as far as like starting the uh, isolation of, of infected patients, quarantining of those who had been exposed and then the travel restrictions. So that, that was all yeah, huge uh, in, in, in the response and, and remarkable that, it, that they, could, they could identify that they were dealing with a new infection so quickly. And, you know, what it has changed to me the most dramatically is the understanding of transmission. Because early on, the thought was that it was spread by fomites, which means like that if I touched the surface and I had COVID-19, that that surface would be, be infectious. Um, and it was only later that we realized that it was respiratory. And, um, and then even later to understand like that, that it, it could be just very short term interactions with people could allow you to inhale enough virus to be infected like 15 minutes of being in a closed space where someone can can transmit the infection. And so there was like this delay in, in using masks, you know, until like really the, into the late springtime, just from a lack of understanding of how it was transmitted. I spoke to a researcher in California some time ago about their studies that were where they go to these remote regions and test bats and 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 different animals to see what sort of viruses could leap to mm -hmm. Uh, man and uh, there's a number of them out there. That type of research, um, you know, it doesn't pay the same sort of dividends as a vaccine, but again, it's on the front end and it's mm -hmm. important. And yet, she was seeing, in, you know, efforts to kind of cut funding for that. If you were to wave a magic wand uh, and give that science edict to a lot of policymakers who probably don't see the benefit of something like that, especially five, six years out. You know, before this, they didn't even see a pandemic coming. What what suggestions or remedies would you uh, suggest? Yeah. With that specific example, that's kind of penny wise, pound foolish, because understanding how much diversity there is in coronaviruses and bats that could potentially infect people will inform how to make a vaccine that could sort of more cover the waterfront and cover the possibilities of the next spillover event. I'd say the other thing I think that I've learned is like that a billion dollars for research is chump change when you're talking about the trillions of dollars of impact that the pandemics had on the economy. And so that investment in research is, is not only the way to go, but it, it, it's, it's foresight, farsighted to, to, you know, to, to do that. Um, in the, and, it's, and it's gonna be hard to maintain because like right now it's, it's easy and obvious to invest in research on vaccines for coronaviruses. Hopefully like a couple of years from now, we'll look back on this as like this terrible year that ended. Um, and it'll be harder to like continue to support like advances in vaccine development, like the plug and play that allowed us to so quickly make a vaccine or understanding like what other viruses, bacteria, parasites could spill over from animals into people to cause new pandemics. And so it's gonna, take like a long memory, I think, to sort of sustain like the research effort that's going to be needed to, to be able to prepare us for the next pandemic. But you've mentioned MERS, you've mentioned Ebola, you've mentioned SARS. I mean, these are not things that happened 400 years ago. I mean, they're in the recent past. Um, there's going to be another one, isn't there? It, clearly, there will be, unfortunately. And you know, the you know, there's three other coronaviruses that are part of like cold and flu season. Probably each one of those was a pandemic sometime in distant human past. Now that virus has adapted to be just like not, not lethal, but part of like the, the picture. So I think that the coronaviruses are sort of notorious for causing pandemics or these so-called spillover events. But you know, H HIV has only been in humans for a hundred years. You know, hepatitis C virus is again a relatively recent visitor to to, to people, um, and so yeah, there's un unfortunately this is going to happen again and again. And, and there was like a lot of 
good research that has been funded by the federal government to prepare us and so that we're in like a much better situation than we would have been if the then if the US had not invested in like vaccine research or in immunology or microbiology all the things that are being brought to bear to help combat the pandemic how quickly uh, can we be exposed to amnesia though I mean uh, the fact of the matter is people are going to get back to they're going to shed the mask they're going to get back to their normal life Mm -hmm. How many years out before we kind of, this is the past and we don't really see this as an issue when we should continue to be focused on this moving forward, right? We should. And I think that there's things that can be done. Um, like, for example, like being prepared to have like a, a big diagnostic test response to the next, you know, next episode of a pandemic. And so when the first few cases are showing up, understand like from our, our past experience where we were so handicapped by not having adequate ability to diagnose this infection. And, and so being able to rapidly ramp up diagnostics, just like we've been able to rapidly ramp up vaccine work. You know, another area we haven't talked about at all is, is therapy. All of these viruses, it's quite possible to make therapeutic agents that would be very safe because the virus has its own enzyme. Currently, Dr. Petrie and other researchers in his lab are studying the effects of COVID-19 on the immune system and looking for new treatments and vaccines. Typically, vaccines require years of research and testing before reaching the public. But in 2020, scientists embarked on a race to produce safe and effective coronavirus vaccines in record time. Talk to us about the different kinds of vaccines, because I guess there, there's different types of vaccines you can come out with. Uh, why is this one more speedy than what we've seen in the past? I mean, walk us through how long it normally takes, because it's, it's a marathon, whereas this seems like a sprint. You, you're right. One example that comes to mind is the polio vaccine, because the polio virus was grown in laboratory culture in 1952. And it was like six years later that, that Salk was able to do a vaccine study of uh, a million children to show you could protect against polio by vaccination. And that was extraordinarily fast. Uh, we've been working in our lab on a vaccine against a parasitic infection called amoebiasis for 30 years. Some of the things that, the, that came about to allow that to happen is that the two leading vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, use messenger RNA as the vaccine, which is a completely new approach to things. That messenger RNA encodes the spike-like a protein of the coronavirus. And we know that if you make antibodies against the spike-like a protein, the virus can't get into your cells and can't cause an infection. And so this ability to use mRNA is, part, is really sped vaccine development, and, and it leads to a very, very effective immune response. So to have a vaccine that's 95% effective is, is unheard of. So it's not only has it been really fast, but they're incredibly effective. And we know that they're very safe from the first 30,000 people that have been immunized. We're not seeing any severe adverse events due to the vaccine. So it's a tremendous story. One of the vaccines though, if, uh, it's my understanding, has to be kept at such a cold temperature mm -hmm. that, it, that that can produce some problems. Some areas don't have that kind of refrigeration. So talk, walk us through the, the next step. Uh, you know, It's released to the public, but what are some of the perhaps drawbacks that could occur? And you're right that the freezers are, that's a super cold freezer. It's not the kind that you have in your home. It goes to minus 80 degrees. So we have them in our lab. They're again, like pre-positioning these freezers. And so that'll make the vaccine more difficult to distribute, but it is stable in a refrigerator for three days. And so, so that, that helps. And then the Moderna vaccine is stable in a refrigerator for about a month. And so, so the Pfizer may, is going to be the first out, maybe the more difficult one to distribute. And then the Moderna, and then the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is sort of close behind, also is at refrigerator temperatures. If I'm one of those people who can get in and get a vaccine, because I suspect, you know, they've got different categories of who goes first. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that. 
And then also uh, talk to us about what's going to happen. I'm going to get that injection, and then am, am I going to be achy? What, what can I expect? So right after you get the vaccine, you can expect that your arm is going to be sore probably for 24 hours, just like it is with, with any vaccine. Some of the subjects, about 2% are getting like a low-grade fever or muscle aches or joint aches. And again, like that lasts for a day, two at the maximum. Um, the other thing to be prepared for is that both vaccines that are going to be approved first require two doses. And so we're going to have to get people back three to four weeks later for the second dose for it to be effective. In January of 2021, the World Health Organization released a preliminary report looking at how governments and public health organizations worldwide responded to the coronavirus. The panel made clear that the world needs to rethink its approach to outbreaks. The overall global response, how would you describe it? I mean, if you were to able to change it in any way, what, what would it be? Well, I think there's a lot of really good things about the global response, probably partly due to the Gates Foundation and support of like developing manufacturing capacities in countries like India for vaccines and drugs so that developing world countries are much more able to respond to their own problems now. And so I think that's, that's been huge. I think like looking back in the early days of the epidemic, probably one thing that could have been done would be to have better diagnostic testing capacity for all countries so that the cases could be identified and isolated and contacts quarantined. I think that that's one of the lessons learned from this that we need to do better next time. There are many vaccine candidates undergoing large-scale clinical trials and several have already been approved for emergency use in countries including China, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization is tracking more than 150 other potential vaccines in preclinical development by pharmaceutical companies, academic institutions, and government agencies. We uh, have talked about some of the vaccines here in the United States. Um, I, I do remember when Sputnik V came out in Russia mm -hmm. that uh, Dr. Fauci was like, I'm not taking that vaccine. Yeah. And yet some uh, British experts on vaccines just said that it's, it's remarkably effective, um, which I guess gets back to the speed of getting something uh, out to the general mm -hmm. public that, and this mitigating steps you have to take. Um, and I think that was the concern about what was happening in Russia is it's just getting it out there too quickly. So walk us through some of the players in addition to the U.S. who have vaccines out there and why that's so critically important to have more than just one player. Well, I think everyone is taking a similar, if not identical, approach to vaccination, which is to develop an antibody response against the spike like a protein of the virus. And so this is like a great target for, for a vaccine because the virus doesn't mutate the way like influenza does. And so this is really, it's Achilles heel, is an antibody response against that spike like a protein will neutralize the coronavirus in Virginia, just like a coronavirus in China or in Russia or in England. Um, and so that lends itself to like many different approaches being successful because this is like the best thing to try to vaccinate against because it's, it actually has a proofreader. It's like when you're using like Microsoft Word, it has spell check. Well, this virus has the equivalent of spell check. And so it takes mutations out. So it's the ex exact opposite of influenza. And so that's, why, so that's why it's such a great target for a vaccine. But even so, it's been amazing how effective the vaccines are at protecting from it. What about the silver bullet aspect of vaccines? Uh, so many people just feel like it's this, once we have the vaccine, everything's back to normal. And, and you keep hearing a lot of health professionals cautioning that, no, it's going to make a difference, but it's not like instantaneous. So walk us through that aspect of it. A vaccine that's 95% effective is just incredible. Um, and I think that in all likelihood, we'll be back to like Thanksgiving more as normal next year. You won't be visiting your elderly patient, parents worrying that you're going to transmit a, a lethal infection to them. Um, there, that being said, there are unknowns. We don't know how effective the vaccine is at preventing asymptomatic infection. So all these studies have been looking for, for disease that, that where there's symptoms, and that's how the vaccine's 95% effective. 
So we don't know about asymptomatic infection. We also, frankly, don't know like what side effects we're going to see when we start vaccinating millions of people as opposed to tens of thousands. So it's going to be in orders of magnitude more people being vaccinated. And so very rare averse events could show up that the no phase three study is going to detect. So th there's, there's, there's a few things, but I think like right now, it's just, it, everything is just pointing to the vaccines making all the difference in the world. Dr. Petrie, it's been a delight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah.